Hey guys, what is up and welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at all of the latest and greatest changes to CMU Emulator that we've gotten in the last two to four weeks. Now, I do apologize for not making this video sooner, but as some of you already know, my life has been pretty damn hectic for the last one to two, three months. But now that all of that is out of the way, and also the fact that I now have an actual proper recording setup, including a brand new camera, thanks to my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys for that, by the way. You guys are super awesome. Uh, yeah, we can just get back to making videos, including this one. Now, these changes all came to see you in the last, what, three, maybe to four weeks. And obviously, when the new version releases in the next few days, I'll also make a video on that. So, of course, make sure you're subscribed and hit the little bell icon to get notified as soon as that video gets uploaded. For now, let's jump straight into it and take a look at all of these changes we now have in the latest public versions of CMU Emulator. Okay, so first up, we're going to be taking a look at every single change from the last three or four weeks. As I said, every one of these changes are already released and available in the latest public builds. These changes are everything we were given in versions 121.4 and 121.5. As I said, apologies for not releasing these videos and letting you guys know what has changed sooner than now, but as I also said, my life was pretty hectic and there wasn't really too much I could do about it. We're going to be taking a look at some general changes, some GX2 changes, some changes to OpenGL and Vulkan, and also some very, very nice CPU, JIT, recompiler and audio changes that came in these two versions. Starting things off, we're going to begin with the general changes they updated the memory searcher tool. This fixed a regression that made this tool crash in previous versions. And on top of this, the memory searching tool is also now multi-threaded, meaning that for anyone using it, you can expect much superior performance in use. The next change is pretty damn sick. And to be honest, I didn't think it was so great when I first heard about it. But upon using it within CMU, I can see just how useful it's going to be. They have added a new CPU mode called Auto. When selected, this will use either single, dual, or triple core recompiler, depending on the amount of physical cores your own system has. For example, if your system has one to two cores, it's going to use single core recompiler. If it has three to four cores, it'll use dual core recompiler. And if your CPU has five or more cores, it's going to use triple core recompiler. These are pretty much the exact same settings I have been recommending in my setup guides for the last few years, so it's pretty damn awesome that when setting this recompiler option to auto, it's now going to automatically do this for you, taking a lot of the annoyance out of setting up CMU and getting the best possible performance. For any games where you have not already set up your recompiler, be it single, dual or triple, this auto recompiler is going to be the new default meaning that CMU is automatically going to use the best recompiler for your system. Some small precautions I would advise users take is that if you encounter any crashing or freezing in your games, you should try to set your recompiler to either a single or dual core to see if it fixes those issues. This is mainly to be done since not all games are perfectly compatible and stable with multi-core recompilers. Our final two general changes for these new versions include a brand new UI option for verifying online accounts. This now provides more detailed error messages specifically useful for problems with a user's account dot dot file, which they may have dumped from their Wii U in order to use online modes on CMU. The second of these changes is the addition of an option to open the compatibility wiki page for any of your specific titles. This can be done by right-clicking your game in the games list and selecting a wiki page. This will open the compatibility page showing you all the info on your selected game. Moving on to some GX2, Vulkan and OpenGL changes. Tiling Aperture now correctly handles linear texture formats. This fixes garbled and broken textures in multiple games developed by WayForward, for example DuckTales and Adventure Time Explore the Dungeon. Moving on to our Vulkan and OpenGL changes, they fixed a bug in the Texture Memory Manager where large alignment requirements would lead to integer overflow. This bug fix fixes random texture corruptions that could occur on NVIDIA Maxwell GPUs and earlier GPUs when using CMU's Vulkan API. 
They also resolved a race condition relating to occlusion queries that could cause the renderer to completely deadlock. This change fixes softlocks in Devil's Third. Our final exclusive Vulkan fix involves a flush GPU buffer cache on frame swap for games that require it due to insufficient cache invalidation. This fixes polygonical explosions in games like Pac-Man and Ghostly Adventures 1 and 2. Moving swiftly along, we also have some changes that affects not only Vulkan but also OpenGL, the first of these being a change to the shader decompiler now adding support for texture size on two MSAA surfaces. This is again used by Pac-Man and Ghostly Adventures 2. Our final OpenGL and Vulkan change involves correctly truncating the lower 8 bits of color buffer addresses. This fixes completely broken graphics in How to Survive. Moving on to some core init and AX or audio changes, they have first of all fixed a softlock in Warriors Orishi 3. This fix involves the correct initialization of the ID field in OS thread. Our final three changes for these new CMU versions revolve around audio changes. By correctly handling looping for AD PCM voices, they fixed the background music and a related crash in How to Survive. They also implemented AX Get Device Final Output. This was again used by Warriors Orishi 3. And our final change is again in relation to audio, where we're told that thanks to small tweaks in audio timing on the emulator, we should hopefully have more stable and performant audio emulator wide. So there we have it guys, those are all of the latest changes to CMU emulator. As I said at the start of this video, as soon as the new release version comes out this Friday, I'll look at that and see exactly what has changed, hopefully in a bit more detail than I was able to do for these past two versions. As I also said, there's a ton of more videos going to be uploaded on my channel, including but not limited to a brand new set of gu setup guides for pretty much every single emulator I cover, including CMU, Yuzu, RPCS3, Xenia, and Ryujinx. So as I also said, make sure to hit the subscribe button and bell icon so that you get notified as soon as those guides are uploaded to my channel. For now, that's going to be it for this video. Once again, guys, thank you all very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. As always, remember to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, and subscribe to the channel if you want to see all future videos from